Thank you so much for everyone for signing in and joining us today. Um, I'm super moved by this show of support and demonstration of interest in collective care. Um, so exciting. Um, you know, in the past two years, in addition to lots of other projects, as Esther mentioned, I've had the pleasure of working with Esther and Eliza to host Deaf Care Cafes. In these cafes, we bring together activists and artists and scholars and community members to have some really important and powerful conversations about the relationships between, around, and within care, care collectives, death, dying, and vitality. Um, this work is particularly concerned with the many ways that various communities are given less access to life and more access to death. In the cafes, um, people have discussions and share stories about death and how it intersects with disability, state violence, racism, queerness, and the ways in which we are closeness with death prompts these communities to take care of each other. As part of our research, we have been listening and working with these death care cafe conversations that dream and cultivate caring futures. Care collectives are absolutely part of this work. As many of you know, I have been surviving and thriving through collective care for more than 20 years now. It's wild. <laughs> uh, it hasn't always been easy. Uh, you know, there are times when I'm not sure how I'm going to get out of bed the next morning or the ways that we are always recruiting, like right now we're recruiting, just, just saying. If you're interested in learning about collective care, there is an opportunity. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, we're not always successful in finding enough people to make the schedule work in a way that is sustainable and allows for folks to share their capacities and get their access needs met. I spend about eight to 10 hours a day engaged in collective care, whether it's in a care shift or coordinating or recruiting. It takes a lot of work to cultivate caring futures, but it's absolutely a project of love, love for my communities and all of our complicated and messy interdependencies. One of my projects during my postdoc was to create a website cultivatingcollectivecare.com. My aim with this website is to create a community resource for anyone interested in collective care. Maybe you're someone who is curious about what collective care can be, or you have your own care collective and are looking to connect with other people to get tips and support. Maybe your interests are more academic and you're interested in how care collectives can reimagine and transform care. It is my hope that this website will meet those needs. Having one of the longest running care collectives, I get a lot of people reaching out to me to get support in setting up care collectives, both temporary ones, like if you're getting gender affirming surgeries and you need aftercare support um, and long-term. Uh, one example, recently someone reached out to me because they wanted to start a care collective to supplement the care they were receiving from the assisted living place where they were um, because they were finding that when their paratransit ride was late for their booking, they had to skip dinner or if they wanted to stay up past 9 p.m. on a Saturday night. So care collective also Collective care also needs to be an ongoing community conversation, and I'm hoping that this website will serve as one place where that can happen. At the end of the talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour of the website. Hopefully, we'll have time. But first, I want to share some of my current thinking around why care collectives are so important and the transformative work they do. Whenever I would go home to visit, as we are saying goodbye, my mom would always say to me and my traveling companions, take care of each other. I always felt really seen by those words. Not only was my mom recognizing the way that the people I'm with take care of me, she was acknowledging the fact that I too was part of the taking care. 
She always, she would also say the same thing to my brothers and their families. And in this way, my mom, who was never totally comfortable with or understood my queerness, with these five words, she embraced my queer family. These words guide me. Before I even realized it, taking care of each other and collective care has been central to all the organizing and radical resistance work I do. After all, organizing at its core is about making sure that people have what they need to live, love, create, connect, survive, and thrive. This realization came to me from several different sources, and I would like to name just a few. Two years ago, I had the pleasure of stumbling across Kim Talbert's powerful work on decolonizing settler notions of kinship, sexuality, and silent science. She describes the activism and organizing of women-led indigenous water and land protectors as caretaking kin. Another place was watching my best friend, AJ Withers, do deeply important anti-poverty organizing grounded in both fighting to ensure that people had access to various programs like the special diet or the housing stabilization fund to try and give folks as many resources as possible to live despite the dreadful inadequacy of government funding. And by calling out structural violence in the shelter system amongst so many other projects and work. I'm a, I also connect, connected organizing to care work through amazing Femme Gimp heart chairs with my friend Arthi Mehta who, used, who discussed the importance of relationship building to organizing work. In addition to this, many years ago, I got the opportunity to participate in an amazing reading group on community accountability and transformative justice led by Arthi and Chanel Gallant. I was already involved in prisoner justice organizing, but this group exposed me to a variety of different TJ organizations that really allowed me to connect collective care with transformative justice. Just as with collective care, there are lots of different ways of articulating what transformative justice is and the work that it does. I am sure a lot of the people in this space are very familiar with transformative justice. And in general, more people are probably a bit more familiar um, with transformative justice and abolition work these days as the amazing movement building and tireless activism around anti-Black racism and police violence that has been happening for ages and ages and ages is finally being talked about and circulated within the mainstream. I have so much gratitude and appreciation for the brilliance of groups like Black Lives Matter. TJ work creates non-carceral or non-punitive and controlling community-based alternatives to the prison industrial complex the medical industrial complex, and the nonprofit industrial complex, all the complexes. Generation Five, one of the foundational groups doing this work, describes how transformative justice, quote, seek safety and accountability without relying on alienation, punishment, or state or systemic violence, accountability, sorry, including incarceration and policing, end quote. TJ comes from Black, Indigenous, people of color, queer and trans, and disability communities who experience long-standing and continuing practices of state and medical violence that, according to Durazo, quote, administer death, disease, and injury, end quote, while simultaneously excluding the exact same communities from care, resources, and services. Care collectives and abolition work responds to this double, triple, quadruple bind that marginalized communities have to navigate. Recently, we have seen how COVID highlights this double, triple, quadruple bind of marginalized communities experiencing increased and increasing state and medical violence being excluded from systems of care. We know that privilege acts as a cushion and promotes ease. Marginalized communities are more exposed to situations putting them at risk of contracting COVID-19 due to structural inequality, whether it's precarious working conditions with no choice for staying home 
or migrant workers forced to live in overcrowded bunk houses, or the way that particularly Black, Indigenous, disabled people are overrepresented within prisons and other institutions, or Indigenous communities living on reserve who don't have access to clean water. Also, Gary Kinsman, reflecting on lessons from the AIDS crisis for this current pandemic, reminds us to always question, quote, which public is being defended and whose health is being protected, end quote. There are so many ways people are constructed out of the public. One way I experience this as a wheelchair user is when I take public transit and I'm told how nice it is that there are ramps. <laughs> it's not exactly public transit if all of the public can't access it. With regards to COVID, all of the materials on how to reduce your risk are aimed at someone who can independently put on a mask, for example. Guidance regarding making pods is geared around relatively normative family structures. So the only places I've been able to find materials that actually take into account disabled people's um, needs um, to stay safe and virus free are from disabled communities. No surprise there. The only COVID care instructions I've been able to find from the government that specifically addresses disabled folks with care needs is geared towards keeping workers safe from infected patients. While protecting workers is absolutely important, I also think it's very telling that there's nothing that speaks to keeping disabled people safe. As we are written out of the public that needs to be cared for, we are either seen as potential threats or burdens that need to be contained, or we are written off as expendable losses. And then if we do get sick, we are often unable to access healthcare due to various barriers. If we are, if we are able to access healthcare, that healthcare is often discriminatory as seen in the multiple stories about hashtag ICU eugenics. So in this example of the operation of the double, triple, quadruple bind that marginalized communities are constantly navigating, we can see how care in general uh, functions in a similar complicated contextual and relational manner. However, care is multi-pronged. It is a feeling, a concept, a practice, a form of labor, both paid and unpaid. Um, Care can connect us, care can harm and isolate us. Care is political and operates within this flow of power as evidenced in the ways that care work is gendered and racialized. Care is commodified in a way to prioritize profit over people. Care and having care needs is used to justify historical legacies and current enactments of both state and interpersonal violence, control, rehabilitation, cure and containment. Care is also at the very heart, pun intended, of historical legacies and current enactments of resistance and community building. I'm currently experiencing with referring to these different manifestations and approaches to care as carceral care versus collective care. Carceral care seems to be a developing concept in COVID-19 biopolitics and abolitionist care beyond security and containment, Eva Budman brings into conversation locations often kept separate in analysis, such as prisons, deten detention centers, nursing homes, and long-term care facilities as sites where carceral care happens. For Renyo Huang, it is reflective of neoliberal reform-oriented work that happens in prisons. And I take from this work that the care in these situations is lip service utilized to maintain systems of power. For me, I'm using the term to refer to and link together institutional forms of care enacting violence, control, commodification, and containment. In addition to naming and challenging these manifestations of structural and systemic violence, a major component of transformative justice and abolition work is about imagining abolitionist futures. Futures without cages and carceral logics. Futures where communities work together to ensure the survival 
and flourishing of all, I've been using my time at the School of Disability Studies to spend time with stories of communities coming together to take care of each other. Stories of cultivating caring futures. Some of these stories have been told in our death cafes, death care cafes, and some of them have been, I've been reading about or some combination of the both. And there are many examples. Like in the early days of the AIDS crisis, witnessing intense medical violence, neglect, and stigmatization, communities came together to make sure that people were kept hydrated and held. They advocated for better treatment and medications. They shared information about how to keep each other safe and healthy. They created hospices that were run by community members for community members. They politicized funerals and made up made public acts of rage, grief, and dissent. They took care of each other. The breakfast programs and neighborhood self-defense programs at the Black Panthers Party is pretty well known and absolutely foundational for similar projects that followed, but less known is their work on interrupting racialized medical violence and racialized science. They held free medical clinics to provide actual health care. <clears throat> Alondra Nelson's Body and Soul, The Black Panther Party and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination is an excellent resource for learning about this work. <clears throat> I also love the stories of collective houses, like the ones connected to House Ball Culture or Star House, which was part of STAR, which was Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, um, and a group that Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson were a part of. Um, these houses participate in a long history of street-involved racialized queers and or sex workers living together to share rent and stories, sorry, rent and resources. As their very existence and their work were criminalized, they also shared and cultivated community skills for keeping each other safe from cops, bad clients, and racist, transphobic, or phobic violence. These houses also served as important places for building chosen family and feeling loved and recognized. There have been many significant moments in my journey to collective care I was sent to, the, sent to university in Richmond, Virginia with 12 hours of tenant care. Now I think about that and I'm just like, I realize how amazing that was. Uh, this care was provided by agency home care workers and paid for by the Department of Rehab Services. Thank you to Ed Roberts and the work of the rolling quads and agitators involved and the 504 sit-in that took place literally one year after I was born. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone to university. Um, anyway, about two years into my undergrad, my case got switched over to a new caseworker, Helen Robertson. I love saying her name, calling her out, even after all these years. Literally, her first words to me were, over the phone, were, you are getting entirely too much care. You were getting entirely too much care, aside from being obnoxious, communicates many of the problems of institutional care models. It poses disabled people as burdens and care as undermined as a commodified finite resource. Additionally, minus a few quite lovely exceptions, the government funded um, care through an agency I received was rampant with homophobia and disabledist conceptions of me and my life as a job, a task to be completed. Sometimes attendants would leave their shift early, leaving me stuck with no way to get into bed because they were so uncomfortable with my queerness. Because of the medicalized idea of care that the agency was working from, they couldn't conceive of me as being a multifaceted person who was part of a community that part of their job in providing care to me was also supporting me to be queer and to be a part of various communities. After two years of fighting, my hours got cut in half. 
On top of not being able to meet my care needs with six hours, I couldn't find anyone who could afford to work for the $6 an hour the government was offering, so we started the first iteration of the Care Collective. Over the next several years, as things in my life changed, so did the operation of the Care Collective, something not possible with institutional care. I literally would not be here in Takaranto without collective care. As a non-resident, I was not eligible for any government support around care. Due to the disabilism inherent in the immigration process, I only got permanent residency two years ago after living here for 15 years. In Richmond, I was a core organizer with the Queer Liberation Front, tired of never being able to find accessible spaces to hold rad queer events and organizing meetings. We transformed this huge warehouse into a collective house and community space called Queer Paradise. We almost got to host Les Feinberg, but they got sick. Um, <laughs> that would have been a dream. With a lot of help from Time Life Books, YouTube, with, with a lot of help from Time Life Books, YouTube videos, tutorials, not a thing yet. We turned this rundown space into the most accessible and collective open home I have ever lived in. We built everything around our bodies and needs. My bedroom doorway was short and wide, built for my body. Everyone else had to duck down when coming into my room. This queer DIY principle informed by feminist practice absolutely informed how we did collective care. It was just part of collective living. It, was also, it also really reflected the way that when we organize together with people we care about, centering the needs of the most marginalized, we can build something beautiful and a bit messy that works for all of us. Sadly, queer paradise did not last very long. In the, last, in the interest of shutting down community spaces, the city condemned the building. After this, as my roommates and I were scattered, we opened the collective to other people in social justice communities. This was the first time that I really began to feel the community building potential of collective care. People with little previous exposure to thinking about disability or care had this very embodied experience and exposure to different ways of being and living. It has also provided an opportunity for what were fairly overlapping but separate communities. So like the radical queers and the radical straights and the mainstream gays and the radical queers for us to come together and be vulnerable with each other, learn and surprise each other. I got to be able to express, and I got to be able to express my sexuality and queerness without worrying about not being able to go to the bathroom or get into bed. Mia Mingus, in one of her many amazing essays, describes transformative justice work as, quote, building communities where we all belong, end quote. She urges us to practice a quote, principle of possibility and practice. I really like how she uses practice. And contrary to the adage, practice makes perfect, I think practicing through collective care, we get something so much better than some BS idea of perfect. We get to practice and dream into being important skills, care skills. We hear a lot these days about the importance of self-care and how you need to take care of yourself before you can take care of somebody else, but where do you learn how to take care? Care collectives are an opportunity to learn, feel, and recognize the power and potential of access, intimacy, and interdependence, of what it feels like to be able to ask, practice asking for what you need and responding to someone else's needs. This is another aspect of what I envision for the Cultivating Collective Care website sharing stories like the ones mentioned here, where we learn from our collective brilliance, knowledge, resourcefulness, and magic. We are practicing choosing each other. We are practicing taking care of each other. We are practicing cultivating caring futures where we get to be our whole complex, tender, lovely, awkward, interdependent, 
fabulous, fierce, thoughtful, and caring selves. Thank you. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> amazing, amazing talk. Um, I was seeing all the, the questions and comments pop up on the side, and it seems like everyone found it really, really informative. And I'm really happy to, you know, be part of this. You know, I've been thinking a lot about hair um, since. I mean, I've been thinking about hell all my life because I, you know, I was, I was very, very, when I was born, I was very sick, and I've been in and out of hospitals pretty much the first 14, 15 years of my life. And so um, I've had a lot of experience with others caring for me, mm. or trying to care for me. Uh, including my, my, my family. And so hair and hairing has been very much something I've been always kind of preoccupied by. And so I think in that sense, I, I, I thought that you kind of spoke to a lot of things that I've been thinking about for a very long time. The other thing that I've been thinking about is the relationship between hair and vulnerability. And I was wondering how you saw that relationship or how, what that relationship meant for you. Because I've always felt that in order for us to accept her, we need to be somewhat vulnerable to others. And in order for us to offer her, we need to see others as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And vulnerability is not a sign of weakness, but it is, and it, I, I believe it's a sign of strength. But I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that, about the relationship between health and vulnerability. Yeah, I love talking about that. Um, and I was sad because I, I had to, there's so many things I had to get rid of um, for this talk. But um, the thing that I think is so powerful about collective care is that rather than it being um, because of the way that it is designed to not be one directional um, and like I would argue that like care you know even when it is crafted or constructed so that it seems like it's one dimensional like someone is taking care of someone else it's still multi-directional like it's always multi-directional um, but because it's like in collective care, it's this intentional uh, act of mutuality and relationality, right? Like, so people doing care shifts, um, like in my experience and the way that my care collective works, it's not like I'm the only vulnerable person. Like we're both these like out bodies in this moment of care, right? Um, you know, people, when they're doing, like, their first shifts, or even if they're doing their, like, 800th shift, like, you know, they're like, oh, I just biked up the hill, and I'm sweaty, sorry, it's like, bodies are part of, part of what we're doing in that moment together, and so I think the fact that we're in this space of shared vulnerability, where we're, like, negotiating both of our vulnerability and our capacities and our uh, needs, uh, it really changes what happens in that moment. And I think that that's part of what's so powerful uh, in a like learning sense within mm -hmm. collective care. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that. You know, it's interesting as, as, you, as you thought more about that. You know, that, you know, what in, I was thinking more about what is changed in that moment. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, both, they're both parties have been vulnerable to each other and for each other. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that requires a certain amount of risk. So risk is something I've been thinking about also mm -hmm. in relation to how. 
Um, I mean, I, 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 I've done a fair bit of work on this in relation to, you know, stuff I've done with HIV, AIDS, and now that, and stuff like that, you know, the question of risk comes up quite often in that sense, and of, of risk assessment, which is a whole other conversation to kind of think about. But I was thinking about what it means to also, in, you know, connect hair with risk. And I've been thinking about this in relation to kind of living and trying to survive through this pandemic, you know. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were all asked to stay home and under a lockdown and to really think about what it means to care for ourselves and others and not risk, you know, getting ill. But then there are other ways in which I think this can be put up there. I mean, one way in which I've been thinking about that is in uh, the protests that have been going on in the States, uh, the BLM protests that have been going on in the States for the last couple of months, and what it means to actually be able to risk lives to actually combat and resist state violence. You know, I'm putting myself out there at a protest because that, it, that is actually a moment of preservation for my life. You know, I, you know sometimes worse things in the world in the violence, like state violence or police brutality. And so I was thinking about the ways in which we're navigating sort of the question of risk and how we care for ourselves and our survival and also how we care for others. And I was wondering if that was something that you've been thinking about as well. Oh yeah, I've been thinking so much about risk right now. <laughs> um, as someone who, you know, cannot disconnect from community, cannot hide in my apartment. Well, I hide in my apartment, but um, people come through my apartment a lot so that I can get out of bed and go to the bathroom and whatnot. Um, but, you know, it also is really reminding me of the ways that queers and disabled people and um, folks who have been navigating all of this, like, mess of structural inequality and violence is like we gain some really badass skills in talking about and um, ne negotiating risk, right? Um, so, you know, it, it becomes a collective conversation. Um, and that's something we've been really like thinking about and exploring within the Care Collective because like we're trying to figure out like ways that we can support folks who maybe want to go to protests, but that's like a bit more high risk of them coming in contact with like COVID or whatever. Um, and then like, we don't want, yeah, like how do we create and respond as a collective? Because we're also very much wanting to support the activism that's happening. So we, have been having lots of conversations about how to have collective conversations about risk and you know maybe it's that one week someone wants to go to the protest so then somebody else covers their shifts for the next two weeks so that they can go and then the next time that person will go to the protest um and also um i think that um in terms of like something I've thought about for a really long time in terms of like safety is the, the myth of uh, iso like isolation keeps us safe or, you know, like it's like the same way that they like prisons use the justification of like removing dangerous people and putting them in these institutions to keep the rest of the world safe. Um, isolation doesn't actually keep people safe. It makes us more exposed to risk and and harm and violence um and so the fact that like i have a community of people that are connected to each other in various ways is also a way that i keep myself safe 
um, from harm um, because there is like that community accountability piece um, that isn't there in the same way within traditional care models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Though it is a, it's a very significant, significant part of how you think about creating new ways of um, uh, sort of feeling like you're part of a collective and mm -hmm. feeling like that a collective can be there to care for you in ways that perhaps are not so easy to access. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I like the way in which a care collective also comes to become a kind of family unto itself. Absolutely. And it's very, very interdependent mm -hmm. and accountable to one another. And I think that's something that's kind of stuck out for you in, in what you were talking about. Yeah, and I mean, I think we should move to the questions.